Um, good morning, everybody. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, the work we've done on the Panoi in Russia, uh, and then give you some of my thoughts on how the, the average fisherman feels about the work we're doing, etc. Um, this is the Panoi, which is right in the middle of the Kola. It's um, a wonderful camp. We think it's a great camp. There are quite a few camps on the Kola. This river is extraordinary. It's, it's 400 miles long. There is no population on it except for two tiny villages. Therefore, for, the, for its size, it's an extraordinary example of a completely untouched Atlantic salmon environment. Um, in its heyday, it had 600 people living um, in the mouth of the river, and they were all connected to the netting of the river, which, as I'll show you, was pretty comprehensive. But that's a lot of people processing a lot of fish. But um, beyond that, the river was hardly fished. Not even the Sami people or any of the local populations fished the river to any great degree. Um, it's a very successful river. Uh, the runs, as I'll show you, are in the tens of thousands. And uh, people come every year. We have a great guide team who are particularly keen. Um, we've had extraordinary experiences. This is an earplug fly, 70 fish in a day have been caught on that fly. If you ever want to use an earplug, this is a really key piece of equipment. Because if you don't have the condom, you don't hook the fish effectively. Um, but it, it's, it's been extraordinarily productive. The record on this rod is a 15 pound salmon. That, that is a piece of kindling that we just strapped a, strapped a reel to and went fishing. So, you know, what, what it does and what it's produced it is extraordinary in terms of um, anglers, angling tourism, the quality of fish, etc. But there's a much bigger story to it. I'm just sort of flashing through some, some photographs to just show you. <coughs> we are conservation-minded. As you'll see, we have a, a very serious um, scientific program. We give speeches every, year, uh, every week to the guests about the work we do, about the tagging program, which I'm going to tell you about, etc. We're not fussy. You know, if, a, if a fish is a bleeder, we will use it, we will kill it, we will eat it. Um, we don't have rules where you've got to put the fish back even though it's bleeding, etc. Um, so now down to the business end of it. This is, we work with, um, we used to work with the Atlantic Salmon Federation and PINRO, the Polar Research Institute, and some of these slides are from them. This is where they see uh, the fish in this area. These are, and I'll show you these later, are nets and methods of, of catching the salmon. And in my day, I have, uh, there was poaching, there still is some poaching, and I have uh, sort of spent my time in little helicopters flying the coast, jumping out of helicopters, cutting the net, jumping back in before the military come after me. By the time I get back to camp, they're calling me saying, what the hell are you doing? Um, the, the last slide was about the tributaries. It has a very wide uh, variation of tributaries, and the fish use the tributaries extensively. If you, you know, the, big, the big stem is the main panoi, and you can see how well used the tributaries are. Um, the two on the left are quite small. Neither of them are really fishable. The one on the right is a, is a beautiful river, probably about the size of the neighbor. We do fish it from time to time, but now we, we tend to leave it as a sanctuary and we keep a camp on it as a guard camp. So it's, it's basically unfished. We also carry out par surveys in the summer and do all the necessary work there. I'm gonna keep going on these slides, but, but you can have copies of them later. Um, and we have a live-in scientist who is in camp for the entire season. And uh, during the summer, he will have other staff come and join him to do electrofishing and park counts and all the scale readings and all, all the stuff that we do. The Polar Research Institute think that our fish go to the Norwegian Sea. Uh, a lot of people think they go under the ice. 
but um, the scientists in Russia don't agree with that. They think they go to where it's shown on the slide. Um, and this is where it begins to get interesting. This is how they have netted and caught the fish off in, in Russia over the years with various methods. Um, and this is a bigger picture. It was, it was called a ruse. Until 1994, there was a net across the entire Panoi. They would open it one day, and they would close it the next day. And that went on for the entire season. So every second day, the river was closed completely. Um, so, and every fish was caught and counted and registered. That's how they knew the populations. That's why their records have been so accurate for so many years. Obviously, from a recreation point of view, people coming to fish, knowing that the river had a net across it, wasn't a very satisfactory situation. So, in 1994, oh, this, is, this is just, sorry, to explain the runs, which are quite unique on Panoi. So, um, when we arrive, which we're about to now, in the river are Celts that have spawned last September, October, and what we call overwintered fish, who arrived fresh, starting in August, and kept on coming through the ice. And some of them have coloured, if they arrived early enough to be in warm water, the rest will be mint silver, you'll think they're fresh fish, but if you look in the gills, you'll find gill maggots. So the Celts go to sea, and then the summer run arrives. The summer run is a mixture of grills and, and big, fat female fish. Oh, this is an example. Um, then the fish that were autumn run will go colored, while the, the summer run fish are still fresh. And we get these, what we call crocodiles, which, which get very red, very slim, but um, there are lots and lots of them in the river from the previous autumn run. Then, as the season goes on, beginning of August, you end up with the river half dark fish and half, or beginning to be half, autumn mint bright fish. And these fish are extraordinary because they come ready to be in the river for 20 months, not your average 12 months. Um, because they come in in August, they stay that winter, they stay the next summer, they spawn in the, in the autumn, they stay the next winter, and they'll go back to sea in the, in the, um, the next spring. And this is a great example. These two fish came into the river pretty much a year apart. Exactly. They're both 20 pounds. So the darkies do their thing, and then everybody goes on and we go back to we go back to the autumn. Um, so in 1994, we all got together with the Russians to try and negotiate the removal of the ruse or the net. And the solution was to um, remove the net and replace it with a tagging project. And what we have to do is tag a thousand fish as quickly as we can. And this is where the angler comes in because I don't know how many of you have a tagged fish, but if you do it properly and write all your notes, etc., it's probably a five to ten minute job. Meanwhile, the angler who's been guiding is, is sitting waiting for the guide to get back to work, etc. Um, and the way we work out, you can see the equation there, that is how we work out the population density of the river. We, we tag a thousand fish to get a key number of fish in the river, and then we can work out the population of the river through the recaptures. We also get great recapture data. This is one of the cards of how we record. Um, this is some stats on how many fish we've tagged and how many recaptures we've had. Here are some interesting recaptures. This is a classic. This is Mike Fitzgerald, founder of Frontiers. Caught a fish, had a cigarette, went back in the river and caught the fish again. So anybody who says catch and release doesn't work, I think we could challenge that. Um, this is a, a really interesting fish, I've, and I've got lots of examples. So it enters the river as a 10 pound fish in 2006. It spawns the next year, 2007. 
It's recaptured in the spring of 2008 as a Celt on its way back to sea. It then came back uh, two years later and got recaptured again as an overwintered fish in 2011. So that fish has been caught from a tagging point of view three times. Twice as a fresh fish, once as a kelp. Here's another example. Again, came into the river, did its thing. You can read what happened. And everybody can have a, a copy of this if they'd like it. Um, this is a different river. This is the Alta, where they tag briefly for a few years, but it's a great story. 25 pound female, caught in 2007. The same angler with the same fly in the same week <laughs> caught the fish two years later. <clears throat> we keep meticulous statistics, and again, I can give you copies of these, but I'm going to keep moving. Uh, it is an extraordinary river. I mean, it, you know, for a river that fishes 18 weeks to have its lowest average per rod as 19 or 20 fish in a week is extraordinary. Um, here's just a few more slides of the river and what, how we go on. This is the autumn. These are autumn fish. So these fish have come to spend 20 months in the river. So we also ran a catch and release project. Um, we fenced off about a soccer pitch size of, of river around home pool, which is a big area, in 1995. And it was at a time when everybody was slightly questioning catch and release and, you know, do the fish survive, et cetera, et cetera. And we did with this, this was the ASF with Fred Wieriski. And um, the idea was we fence off a, a chunk of river where the, the fish can uh, survive in a, in a normal habitat. It had current, it had everything. It wasn't just a sort of a dark slough or slow piece of water. And the idea was to catch lots of fish, record everything that happened to them, put them in the net tagged in the area, and see what happened. Well, 66 of the 67 fish survived. The one that didn't survive was a bleeder upon capture. So it was probably always destined to, to, to be caught. So it didn't really tell us anything other than there is a very high survival rate. I think if um, this was done in the spring when the water's quite cool, if it had been done in the summer, there probably would have been a higher death rate. But um, that, for me, convinced me that catch and release remained, uh, you know, is a very effective tool. Um, so uh, one of the other things, you know, the subject of this is, is involving anglers in what we're all trying to do. And uh, I've spent 25 years with people fishing on the Panoi and watched how they react to the work we do, the scientific evenings that we do. You know, people really listen. They want to know about their tag fish. I, I, in, in 10 years of looking after people, actually guiding people on the river, I never had anybody complain that I was taking too long or intolerant of the tagging process that has to go on. The tagging itself is very quick. There's a tagging gun. It's like doing a piece of clothing. Um, but, you know, you've got to write the notes down. Otherwise, it's, and you've got to weigh the fish. You've got to do the length. You've got to do it properly. Otherwise, there's no point in doing it. And that takes time. I can't remember anybody ever complaining about that. The, set, the, the fishermen embrace it. Um, but I, 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 you know, today is a new beginning with Robbie and his team, and uh, it's a new effort, etc. But I, I, one of the things I want to point out is I think the clock is ticking. And the reason why I think the clock is ticking is because the next generation have got other options. And in my opinion, they are going to be less tolerant of no fish, spending lots of money, catching nothing. And therefore, there is the potential for the support that we all need to wane. And I think it's a really real possibility, and it's beginning already. Um, some of the younger generation think we're crazy. We spend all this money, and we go, oh, well, you know, it was too hot, 
So the 10K, the 10K we spent, we'll try next year. They can, you know, they can go and catch more fish, crazy fish, more willing to take fish, cool destinations, etc., etc., elsewhere for a hell of a lot less money. So I, I think we've got to do two things. We've got to get on with what we're trying to do, but we've also got to try and involve the young and get them fishing. It's very difficult to get a young person interested in fishing if they don't catch anything. And it's tough to get them to catch, it's tough to take a young person to Scotland and get them to fish. And that's a problem in terms of getting people interested. You know, there are other species, Golden Dorado, there are, there are these crazy fish, there are other destinations. There are so many places and so many options. Atlantic salmon in the next 20 years is going to have a real problem if we can't arrest what's going on. So one of the things I want to announce today is we are ready to host 20 novice young people in Russia to get them interested, show them what we're doing. We want to agree, um, that is the owner of the Panoi and his son, who is an extremely keen fisherman. We want to agree how we select these people, but we think we've got to start getting people fishing. And um, we can get them out there in the summer, we can get them fishing, and then we can use what they do to try and promote salmon and educate people. So we made that offer today. Um, and then I just want to reflect on my experience with Atlantic salmon. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a river owner, I'm no big shot in, in, in the salmon fishing world, but I've seen a lot in 20, 30 years. I ran this campaign under the anagram of Charles Teats, which is anagram of catch and release. The field took the eight pages, and what it basically did is say, we've got a problem, we need to release fish, it is part of the solution. The field embraced it. Uh, Andrew, apologies to you. Trout and salmon wouldn't take it because at the time they didn't agree with catch and release. I had to raise 13,000 pounds to run a, basically a promo for catch and release in trout and salmon. Those days, and I'm not trying to take a dig at trout and salmon, but we have all got to start working together. We have all got to start pulling together. The Panoi is a very easy target to raise money. Can we have a week on Panoi to raise money? But with the exception of Ken, nobody has shown any interest in the work we've done in 25 years. That's got to change. We have to pull together as a community. Um, Tom, just come up a second. The last example I want to give you is I attended the first meeting of the North Atlantic Salmon Fund when, as a group, we got together to try and work out how to raise money for Ori. I was a whippersnapper at the time. I don't really know how I was there, to be honest, but I was there. And the great and the good were there, and there was lots of chin, chin scratching, and ooh, and how are we going to do this, and what will they say, and et cetera, et cetera. And I left the meeting thinking, how are these people going to do this? How, how are we going to get people to agree? How are we going to go forward? And a, a friend of mine who's much older than me, that I've been lucky enough to fish with him for many years, just said, look, I'll do this. I'll raise the money, but I don't want to be involved in that. That stuck with me for all those years because we have, in order to break this, in order to crack this, those days have got to end. They really have. We have three, uh, you know, the um, great new guys in charge: Robbie, George, um, and Dick. And you know, we've got to work together. We we have got to pull it together. Tom, the reason why I've asked Tom up here is he will judge us tomorrow. I, I sat in that room age 20 something, and for me, we were failed. Now, I'm standing here. Are we gonna fail again? That's my question. And he will be the judge. 
Because in 25 years' time, Tom Leslie, keen fisherman, etc., age 24, 25, will be standing here. Or will he be standing here? Will there be any point in him standing here? So we have to pull together. That's my message. Thank you very much.